Hello, and welcome to Hopkins at Home. I'm Jessica Gill, a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor here at Johns Hopkins University. And today I'm gonna to talk about how we can use biomarkers to improve the care that we provide for individuals who sustain traumatic brain injuries or um, concussions. And we call traumatic brain injuries TBIs. Um, and what we know is they're extremely common in the lives of individuals. So at least one in three Americans will have one or more TBIs or concussions over their lifetime. Most of these TBIs are mild in nature, um, about 90%. Um, in which the individual will have some symptoms, but resolve within a couple of days to weeks up to a month following the injury. But for some individuals, there's persistent symptoms and deficits that can result in lasting impacts on their life, as well as that of their community and their family. We also know that there are certain populations that are at risk to have multiple TBIs that we're really just now starting to understand the impact of. And those include athletes, military personnel, as well as police. And what we know about TBIs as the reason they're common <laughs> is that um, these are things that happen to many of us, including falls, assaults, or being struck by something. And so we look across all of these different components and populations within our group of research where we're looking at the impact of these TBIs over time. And when we care for individuals who have a TBI, especially acutely, what we're looking for is what type of symptoms they're coming in with. Um, to qualify to have a TBI, you must have some of these symptoms as well as someone or the patient themselves really reporting that they had some type of injury. So things that we look for include confusion, memory problems, um, overall concentration problems, or feeling like they're in a fog. Other things are things like being dizzy, um, having a loss of consciousness, ringing in the ears. And what we do when we see individuals is we grade their TBI based on the severity of these acute symptoms and what they're reporting to us. And so what I already said is that mild TBIs are really common as well as moderate TBIs that have a good amount of overlap between mild TBIs. Um, so various TBIs are quite different in which they generally require hospitalization um, and have a very different type of symptom trajectory based on the injury itself. And so today, mostly what I'm gonna be talking about are the more mild TBIs and concussions as well as moderate that overlaps with this. And so in these more mild cohorts, what we're really looking at are things called post-concussion syndrome. And these are pretty vague symptoms. If you look across, you know, if you don't sleep a couple of nights, you might actually come down with something like this. Um, so they're not specific necessarily to TBI, but they're things that we see highly likely after TBI. So we're looking to see if these symptoms get worse in these individuals after the injury. And so we're really linking it again to the sustaining the injury and then having these. Um, many patients might have these prior um, to having the TBI, um, but again, what we're looking for is the type of symptoms that develop following the TBI to really understand what it is. Um, the main thing is we don't have any medications to really mitigate these risks right now. So what we do is we monitor these symptoms and deficits, and then as they present, we provide treatment for, to individuals. So this definitely can be optimized, and I'm going to talk about how we can use biomarkers to do that. Um, really, the focus of my lab um, is to look at the impact of individual variability. So why do some individuals go on to have these lifelong symptoms and deficits, whereas others do not? So that 10 to 15 percent of patients that we see with a mild TBI or concussion, why do they go on to have these lasting symptoms? And so when we look at biomarkers, primarily we'll look at blood, but I'm going to show you some exciting data also on sweat. Um, but we look across different biological mechanisms, ranging from DNA that's inherited from the individual to things like epigenetic modifications that encompass things that are early stressors or things in life like um, chronic stress or even nutrition um, that can change the way that the gene is shaped and becomes biologically active following the injury. We also look at gene activity um, and how that relates to pro ultimately proteomic um, activity and protein production. One of the other exciting areas in our lab that we're looking at are exosomes. And so I'll talk about that and really how we can use the blood to be much more brain specific. And so these are recent advances that I'm happy to talk about today. So when we're thinking about clinical care of these patients, what we're really reliant on are their reports um, of acute as well as chronic symptoms. But as I talked about, one of the symptoms is anxiety or depression or headaches. And that's not specific to TBI itself. It can really relate to other things within the individual's life. 
And so what we want to try to do is get closer and closer to understanding what's really related to the brain injury itself. Again, we have no medications for TBI. So what we're doing is monitoring these acute and chronic symptoms and trying to understand how their trajectory then predicts the onset of things that might be lasting or really have an impact on an individual's life. And so what we do is, of course, we take um, neuroimaging and a CT is what's available in all emergency rooms. So when individuals come in, we use that as a way to look at their blood within the brain. That would be something that we would have to intervene on, like a subdermal hematoma. More recently um, in research, we've also been using MRIs, and that really gives us an ability not to just look at blood presence, but other subacute injuries. And the idea is that if we understand the nature of the injury, because we know that there's a lot of different types of injury, then we can develop um, therapeutics that are based on the mechanism of the injury and be much more accurate in the way that we treat it. And so a lot of the work that we do in my lab is trying to find blood-based biomarkers that map onto these CT and MRI findings. And so when we look at biomarkers, we put them in a couple different classes. Uh, the first is diagnostic in which it indicates which individuals have actually had a brain injury from those individuals who may be coming in with similar injury characteristics or symptoms, but don't have the brain injury. So this is really important when we think about individuals who are intoxicated, um, individuals in the military who may have other um, conditions that are much more medically imminent, um, such as an amputation. And so we don't know that they've had the brain injury. And so we want these to be able to identify if that individual has had the brain injury and that we need to follow them over time. This is also really important when we think about military personnel and re remoted um, deployment stations, as they don't have the same clinical phenotyping abilities, including imaging. And so we're looking for biomarkers that can say, yes, this individual's had a brain injury and that they need to be evacuated for care. Uh, the second category is that it's prognostic. Again, trying to give us a clue of why that 15% or so don't go on to have optimal outcomes. And so that way we can really follow those individuals, provide preventative interventions that mitigate the risk, again, based on the type of injuries that they've had and the symptoms that they may be most at risk for. Because once an individual develops these symptoms and deficits, we know that there's neurological correlates, meaning that the brain has changed. And it's very difficult to go in and change the architecture or the functionality of the brain once that's happened. And so if we can identify these individuals early, then we have a shot at really coming in and saying, let's give this medication or let's do this therapy. So that way that, way that individual doesn't get that. And so one of the examples we've been doing is looking at headache. And so I'm gonna show a little bit of data on that of showing what biomarkers map onto that. So that way we can identify them again early, provide preventive interventions, and then we won't see them chronically and then they'll go on to optimally recover. Headache is also really perplexing is that we know that headache is one of those dominant features and that if an individual has a headache, they'll go on to develop many more post-concussive symptoms later on. And so we're trying to find those symptoms that are really driving this biology and to intervene and use them over time. We're also looking at biomarkers in a predictive way, um, especially for clinical trials when they're being designed. What we wanna do is be able to use these biomarkers to say this individual is more apt to respond to this therapy or less so. So that way we can, again, really personalize the therapies that we're giving and optimize the clinical trials. There's been many, many largely funded um, clinical trials, but again, we haven't been successful. And so it's the perspective of our group that if we can get more close to the mechanism and use these biomarkers to really design these therapeutic trials, that we're gonna be more effective um, overall. Lastly, um, we're looking at them as monitoring. So we wanna look at these biomarkers over time to see if these biomarkers change and what they mean to clinical symptoms. So how can we say at one day or three days or five days, it looks like this biomarker has gone up and this can be problematic. Again, this is really important in remote settings in which the individual is at greater risk because they're not able to get clinical care that's standard. And so we want to optimize that. And I'll give some examples of that. And so the other thing we say is it's not just the right biomarker, but it's the right biomarker at the right time. And so what we do is we look at biomarkers in a couple different phases. The first is the acute phase where we see biomarkers of astrocyte and glial injury going up, um, especially within the hours to days after the injury. 
many of these biomarkers then go down. Um, and then we see subacute biomarkers increasing, especially in those individuals most at risk to have these symptoms. Um, it's only really been recently that we've looked at these biomarkers in a chronic way. And so I'll show you some data on veterans who've had multiple brain injuries and have chronic symptoms. And so we're just really understanding how these biomarkers relate to these kind of remittent symptoms and how we can use them to, again, personalize the therapy that these individuals get. And so the first study I'd like to talk about, um, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna pause for just a second because I see a question's coming in and I wanna address it before we go on to the studies. Um, so the question is, do repeated brain injuries affect the timeline at all? Is there different um, fourth time versus the first? Yes, absolutely. So um, we see that there's an escalating risk with the number of injuries that an individual sustains. Um, it's a little bit more complex than that though, and that it's um, if an individual sustains injuries within a small period of time. So if they have a concussion and they have another concussion four days later, that's even more risk. And so we do see this, especially in our long-term studies, that there's some type of dose escalation where at some point the individual becomes compromised. Um, and so we can see that over our collegiate athletes. And now um, as we're going farther out, we're able to see it as individuals age. And so there's some vulnerability um, and our group is really the first one to show that. And I'll show some data related to tau um, as well as neurofilament light chain that shows that those individuals who sustained previous injuries respond differently. Um, and so that's one of the things that we always look with in our models to really understand the impact of repeated injury. So in this first study, um, this is the NCAA Care Consortium. This was started about eight years ago. And what's really unique about this is that it was done at eight different universities. And so they did a very careful job of making sure that we had enough women and men, as well as a diversity in sports. And so what's also really great about this study is that we're able to get samples that are obtained um, before the individual has any type of collegiate sports experience. And so that really gives us a baseline to look and see how the individual changes in neuroimaging, uh, neuropsychological functioning, as well as biomarkers. The other really interesting component of this is that we have individuals who are matched um, age and gender on the contact sport. So in the concussed group, basically we're watching these individuals over time. When they have a concussion, we're pulling an age gender match contact sport. So if the individual is playing soccer, we'll pull somebody from soccer. Um, but what also is really great is that there's a non-contact sports control group. Um, what allows this comparison is then we can look at the impact of subconcussive hits that happen in more contact related sports. And so I'll show a little bit of data that really kind of brings this out. And then the other really big thing about this is um, looking over time at the impact of exercise. And when we started these studies, we thought, yeah, that's an important thing to look at, but we really just didn't understand how important it was. And so having these three control groups over time um, and then also having the baseline sample really allows us to get closer and closer to that signal. And again, that individual variation that we think is so important. Um, what we've done now is we've gone into a second phase of these individuals. And so we're seeing them coming back after their collegiate careers and we're interviewing them um, doing again, neuroimaging as well as collecting blood to look and see how these concussions impact as these individuals kind of go out and get jobs and get married. Um, and it's kind of a Framingham type study and that it really allows us to go in unbiased and understand the impact of concussions over time. And so that's just starting now. So that'll be a couple of years from now that we'll have more findings. But today I'm just gonna show you um, what we did in the first phase of this project. Um, the first thing we did is we looked at biomarkers over time. And so we did something called a fourplex. Uh, what we do in our lab is a very high sensitivity analysis that lets us look at very small, pro small concentrations of proteins in the blood that come from the brain. Um, so what we say is it's kind of like looking for grains of sand in an Olympic sized swimming pool. So you really need to have this high sensitivity in these more mild um, cohorts. And so just to kind of give a little bit of a background on this and that concussions, um, all of these individuals might've sustained a concussion, but none of them went to the emergency room. So this means they're really the more subtle of the concussions. And the reason that they're being observed is because they're on a playing field and they've got trainers and coaches there to intervene and to monitor that. Um, and so these are really the most subtle types of brain injuries that we see. 
When we went back and looked at the neuroimaging in these individuals, there was only two individuals out of 800 that had any type of imaging finding. And so these really are the most subtle um, of the injury types. And the reason that we look at these four proteins, first, GFAP and ECHL1 are the biomarkers that are approved by the FDA to diagnose um, a concussion. But really in that first study, a concussion was determined to be a CT positive finding. And so that was a much more severe type of injury. That's what we would consider more of a moderate injury. And so we wanted to look at those to see really does the same type of injury, but in a more mild form, um, also see these same um, elevations. And so we were able to replicate that finding. Um, and then when we looked again at some of the other things like tau um, that you see down in D, what we see is an overall increase in tau. And then we see a reduction in tau that's a little bit different than the other biomarkers. And this kind of perplexed us, but it was something we saw before. And so this really led us to think, you know, tau probably is not a brain specific biomarker. And so we did some sub studies in this within athletes, um, just having them run with a trainer, irrelevant of having any type of brain injury or subconcussive hit. And we found that overall their tau levels that we were able to get from finger pricks increased by about 150% um, after they just took a run with the trainer. And so this really kind of led us to the thing that we need to get closer and closer to the brain to really understand it better. I'm gonna go ahead and stop just one second. Um, so the question coming in is, do subconcussive hits still count as TBIs? Do they predispose a patient to have a concussion later? So subconcussive hits are difficult because they're something that we can't measure um, easily without a monitor. And so an individual can have a number of subconcussive hits over a game, but not know that they've had those subconcussive hits. They might just come out and feel like, oh gosh, I feel like this is a little bit different than the other games I played, but they don't know the magnitude of those hits. And so what we've done across our studies is to put monitors in helmets. And that's unfortunately a bias that's there because we can only use helmet monitors at this point in time to really um, look at the magnitude of that. And there's been a number of studies finding that over just one season um, in individuals who play football, that the amount of subconcussive hits that are sustained both in practice as well as in the game relate to neuroimaging findings and specifically white matter abnormalities. And so we do think that they have an impact. Um, what it is long-term, we're not sure. So that was just one season of monitoring that. And so does that then predispose an individual later to have neurological deficits or neurocognitive deficits? We don't know. Um, so that's part of the NCAA care consortium study and what we're trying to understand. I, you know, the question about predisposing them to additional concussions later has not really been looked at. So I can't say um, what direction that would go. We don't know even really what indication there is that subconcussive hits impacting an individual. Um, what we know from our studies of concussion is that if you have a concussion and you don't have full neuronal recovery and you go back into the game, you're about four times more likely to have another concussion. And that's based on changes in balance and neurocognitive things that we can't even really estimate sensitively enough. Um, and so does that same risk for, you know, um, occur with subconcussive hits? We don't know, um, but that's a really good question. <laughs> so I'd be happy to talk about it more. Um, so this is a study in emergency room patients uh, that we saw at uh, our center, which is the Center for Neuroscience and Regenerative Medicine at the NIH when I was there. And so this study was really unique in that we were able to get MRI in addition to CT. And again, MRI is a very advanced technique to look at not just having a brain injury, but the types of brain injury that the individual sustained. And so we wanted to map these same biomarkers onto this. Um, and again, to replicate the FDA study, but then also expand it to see if those individuals who have a mild TBI, but don't have a CT positive finding, do they also have elevations in these same biomarkers? And so we were able to replicate that to say, yes, in CT positive, we see these same elevations in UCHL1 and GFAP, but we also again see it in these more subtle in, in, um, individuals with injuries that we can only detect on an MRI. And so that kind of says, wow, we can actually get to detecting these very subtle injuries just with these blood-based biomarkers and kind of opens up the avenue of we can use these if we don't have neuroimaging available. 
And most hospitals do not have MRIs available. And usually MRIs are used when an individual's had symptoms for a period of time and is not recovering from standard treatment. And so there's not a lot of data on acute uh, MRI data and how that relates to recovery. So this is kind of one of the first series of studies that we've been able to do. Um, the other thing we want to do is, you know, we know that when we see a patient, when we walk into a room, not every patient's the same. And so there's a lot of factors other than the injury, injury that predisposes someone to not recovering. And so we really want to understand how that is impacted. And so what we did is we actually increased um, and we put things in like age and sex and gender to see how those also influence these blood-based biomarkers. Because we think these blood-based biomarkers are really objective. Um, they give us some indication of having the injury as well as prognostic ability. But how can we use things that we know are related to that? And sex and gender have been one of the main things that I've studied looking at the vulnerability of women to have more sustained symptoms over time. And I'll show you a little bit more data on that too. But what we see in the model is when we put all of this together, we actually see that it's much more explanatory than just using what we think is objective data to put that into the equation. And so this is something moving forward. Can we just not use a biomarker, but use some type of algorithm to say previous head injury, um, having a previous sleep diagnosis or psychiatric disorder, or not having health insurance, those type of things. How can we make this much more inclusive? So it's not just a lab test, but it's more integrating all of the things that we know impact recovery and can really kind of benefit um, in this type of logistic regression to really understand the predictive value of these biomarkers in combination with clinical data we can ascertain pretty easily from the patient. Um, what was really great about this study is we actually followed them over time. And I'm gonna show you some data on this. And one of the things that we were able to see is to look at something called meningeal injury. And the way that we were able to visualize this is by using a contrast. Um, and so meningeal injury is really important and it occurs in about half of individuals who have a mild brain injury. And the meninges are really important as they're kind of the conduit between the brain and the blood. And so what we see is that to get blood brain based biomarkers, they have to overcome the blood brain barrier and the lymphatic system to get out there. So it's really important for clearance, but even more important than that, the meninges put support overall recovery in that they deliver micronutrients as well as inflammatory cells into the brain. And these are really the most important things that are needed to necessitate brain recovery. And what we see in animal models um, is that if you knock out the immune system, you don't get sufficient recovery. And we see the same thing in overall human studies. So if you don't see an inflammatory response early, those individuals are actually more prone to have these long-term symptoms because the inflammatory response is necessary for the neuropeptides that can come in and then really facilitate recovery. So we think about this as really important for clearance of proteins that can aggregate including tau. And tau is one of the ones that we know the best. So if tau becomes hyperphosphorylized, basically it becomes really sticky in the brain. And it's one of those proteins that we need to get out. If it aggregates, then it can result in something like an Alzheimer's type of um, disease pathology and that you're getting plaques and tangles. And those plaques and tangles are again related to early onset of mild cognitive impact um, as well as chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And so it's really important when we think about clearance of these and then also the delivery of these micronutrients. And so I'll show you some data related to that. So lastly, within sports, uh, this is one of our earlier studies at University of Rochester. And I talked a little bit about the importance about return to play decisions, but really it's important because right now what we're really reliant on are coaches and family members and the athletes themselves and trainers and often athletes want to get back to the game as soon as they possibly can. Uh, but how do you make sure that they're sufficiently recovered before they go back? And using MRIs, you know, we'll get an MRI, but it takes sometimes a great amount of time to read it in such detail that we can actually use that to inform decisions. So the idea is that can we use blood-based biomarkers to approximate this type of recovery? And so in our first study, what we did is we looked at over time, we got, again, got their baseline, um, and then as they had a concussion, and then we also have the control group, what we saw overall is that tau was elevated acutely and that it goes down. Um, and then again, you know, that's part of the whole idea about 
recovery and exercise. But what we saw in 24 hours that those individuals that had sustained symptoms over time had less reductions in total tau. So it was going down, but it wasn't going down at the same degree. And so again, we see that there's some type of biological activity with tau being elevated and having increased activity over time. And really return to play decisions are more about the symptoms that the individual's reporting. And so we can also map these biomarkers, especially tau, onto those acute symptoms following a concussion. And one of the more really exciting areas too is we can actually map it onto some of the objective biomarkers like balance. Um, that's really hard for an individual to approximate, but we actually have to test to see how their balance is. And so we see correlations of about like 0.6 to 0.7 on um, elevations of tau related to balance impairments in those individuals. Um, and I see that there's two questions but I'm gonna say one more thing about this. Um, in the same study, we looked at the impact of just different sex. And so we see that those individuals who are determined to be, or report that they're female, have overall higher activity in a trajectory analysis, again, at these same data points. Um, what we know is that females tend to report symptoms and also have greater objective impairments. The nature of them, we don't know. So we're engaged in a number of studies to look at the impact of hormones, um, specifically on immune responses, because there's such an interaction between those two. And then ultimately how that impacts the brain um, as imaged through MRI and then also these brain specific biomarkers. And so gender and sex are really something that we think is important to understand because it's been kind of just, we've at least tried to oversample females in a way to make it so they're included and generalized. Um, but it does seem that there's something specific about this that we're really trying to get in and understand better. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a couple of questions. So the first question is how responsive have sports organizations been to these type of tests? What's the next step for um, future buy-in? So, I mean, the NCAA did sponsor this study um, as well as the second phase of the study. So there's definitely organizational commitment for that. Um, part of the study also was funded by the NFL. Um, and so we do have some things that are related to that, but when you get to professional sports, it's, it's a whole nother thing that has a lot of liability related to it. And so I don't think that we're gonna have these machines or these point of care tests in a professional sports arena. Um, I think that's gonna take some time and to really show the benefit of those. And, but I do think we've got a couple of different studies going on where we're looking at individuals after they came out, come out of professional sports. And we're getting much better at being able to measure or approximate the amount of subconcussive hits based on algorithms as well as concussions. And so even though we're not you know, collecting the acute data, I still think that we're gonna be able to understand the cumulative impacts of those over time. So I don't think, a, I mean, I think a buy-in would be great um, to study these in individuals in real time. I don't see it happening very soon, but if anybody has any points on how, how we could do this or any advice, I will, I will definitely take it. Um, and so this kind of goes into what I was talking about before with the nature of the question is that one of our first findings in 2016 was that tau was elevated even years after having a brain injury. Um, and also that symptoms overall related to the degree of elevation. And so again, we see that there's this chronic impact on these biomarkers that we kind of thought were just up and down after a brain injury, but really they can have a cumulative impact on that. What we've done now is we've gone in to try to study tau um, because tau is an umbrella of a lot of different isoforms and not all isoforms are, are the same. And so cis tau, trans tau, as well as phosphorylated tau have a negative impact overall. And again, are more kind of sticky within the brain and are difficult to clear and much more um, damaging when we think about that cumulative impact. And so we're going back to understand not just the total tau levels, but also these sub um, components of tau that might be problematic. The idea of this is that then we can go in with pharmacological agents that can mitigate those specific forms of tau. We can't you know, do everything with tau, but if we know what's causative, then we can get closer to the signal and understand it better. And so <laughs> talking about that, um, one of the things we've done in our lab over the last couple of years is use exosomes. And Exosomes are really exciting in that every cell in the body secretes exosomes. 
And when it secretes that exosome, it puts an antibody on the outside of it that allows us to identify where that exosome was secreted from. And this is really important because what exosomes do is they go and bind to a subsequent cell and the context of the exosome is then transferred into that cell. And then that cell changes its function based on the contents of the exosome. So if you look at, if you look at exosomes and you see that there's more cytokines or chemokines within it, that means that there's a much more predominantly inflammatory state within those exosomes. The other really important thing about exosomes is they're part of the debriding process. And so they're kind of the trash compactors of the brain, as well as all parts of the body, and that they get all the contents within a cell out of it. So we've gone on to be able to see tau and amyloid beta, as well as the other isoforms of tau within these exosomes. And we've been able to look and see how this clearance really impacts these chronic symptoms. And so basically what we've been able to do in our lab is the method is that we isolate total exosomes from the blood. Um, then we look at the type of exosomes that are there based on the antibodies. Then we do a pull down that makes them brain specific. Um, and then, so that really allows us to look at, especially central inflammation, because when we look at say IL-6, it's an inflammatory related cytokine and we know that IL-6 has a lot of different activities across different disease processes. So it's obviously not related just to brain injury, but we wanna understand because it's one of our best prognostic markers. And so when we have individuals come into the clinic, if they've eaten a cheeseburger or stubbed their toe, we don't know if that's related to central inflammation if we're just getting their blood. And so this allows us to say, yes, this is actually from the brain. And this means that the neurons within the brain are communicating in a pro-inflammatory state. And so this really allows us to get over kind of that ability to look at something that's specific and understand the processes um, related to that. And so it opens a door for us to understand processes, not just centrally within the brain, but also within our lab to look at things that are muscle related, um, specifically that of tau, which we know is coming from muscle from our studies within exosomes. And that kind of lets us close the research circle to say, yes, muscle is producing tau. And this is what we're seeing reflected in our tests when we're looking at overall circulating levels of these. Um, the other thing that's really important about exosomes is they're much more biologically active than what the proteins are within the blood. And so we can look at those and really kind of understand what's being transmitted and used as opposed to serum or plasma, which more has things that might be degraded or marked for degradation. Um, and really it kind of gets us closer to that signal of biological activity. And so I'm gonna stop just one second. Looks like there's a question in the chat. Um, yes, so <laughs> the question is, does age affect a patient's ability to recover from a TBI? And if so, how? So I don't have any of that data to show today, but age is a major impact on the ability to recover. And so I can just, give a little bit of one of the studies that we did, and I can also provide a reference to it. Um, in our emergency room setting, we have one setting that's much more older age and then another setting that's less. Um, what we did with this is we looked at individuals who are over the age of 60. And I know that everybody, whatever age thing you put in there, everybody's, somebody's gonna be offended by it. So 60 was kind of our cutoff based on um, distribution of data, so I will say it, um, not older age or any judgments related to that. but. Um, so we looked at gene expression and gene expression is a really great way to look across the genome and in, in a non-hypothesis manner. So you're looking at the activity of genes that are up and down regulated without looking at specific genes itself. So you can look across 8,000 different genes and understand which ones are up and down regulated. So what we did is we compared those individuals over 60 and those individuals under 40. Um, at baseline and follow-up. And baseline was within 48 hours of the mild TBI and then follow-up was within seven days of that. And so what we found is that overall at baseline, individuals that were older had reductions in inflammatory activity in genes. And this was really counterintuitive to what we would think because um, one of the things about aging is you have greater levels of inflammation, greater levels of CRP, IL-6, all those inflammatory markers. And that aging in part at least relates to inflammation. And so we thought, well, of course, older individuals are going to have this greater inflammatory response, but we actually found the counterintuitive of that. 
Um, what we found at follow-up is that there was a reduction in the older individuals' activity of those neuropeptides that facilitate neuronal recovery. And so, again, it kind of plays on to what we see in preclinical studies that you have to have activation of the immune system that, to then have kind of neuroprotective activities or neuronal recovery. And so that does make some sense when we think about it. But again, it's one of those things that you just think, wow, this is not what I thought I was going to see. And even in the study, we, we um, controlled for things like medication um, of all of those things to make sure that it wasn't just something that was in an older individual that would make them less prone to be able to have a really active immune response to it. So that's kind of what we've seen. Um, we're doing more studies than that. One of the other things that is a little bit different in older individuals and we had to control for is that they're much more likely to have falls as opposed to assaults or car accidents. And so, you know, it could also be part of the nature of the injury. And again, I think it also could be what we've talked about a little bit before is that there is a cumulative nature about having brain injuries. And of course, the longer you've lived, the more likely you're at more injuries over time. And so it may be um, that that's also kind of playing a role. And that's not necessarily easy to tease out in, in this type of study. So it's something that we're looking at and I think is really relevant, especially if we think of individuals aging and um, we wanna kind of maintain that and, and how can we make sure that they're protected overall from brain injuries. Um, so, yeah, so I'm getting another question. So looking at these interactions, how responsive is the brain to adapting to a TBI? Are there indicators that indicate an abilities, ability to adapt to changes in the brain structure efficiently? So, we, so the brain remains quite elusive to us. So the only way we can access the brain is um, through imaging, um, which we're still really understanding how to develop technologies and abilities to analyze that. So we're still getting there, but we can't get close enough necessarily. And then when we're looking at it, we're not looking at necessarily connectivity when we're looking at some of those. And so um, it remains really complex. And the only other way we have are neuropathological studies in which an individual donates their brain. Um, and then we can study them by using things where we stain the brain and see which proteins are there. And so we do see that there's some correlation between those studies um, and seeing that if you have an injury in a certain area, you're gonna definitely see it on neuropathological studies. Um, but it doesn't give us indication about why some brain areas are more adept or able to change. Um, we know that you know age, we always think of age of first injuries as being something that might be a bad factor, but actually when we look at it, it's not necessarily a negative factor um, if the individual only had one TBI, because the brain is quite resilient, younger. Um, so we think that there's a lot of, um, you know, reactivity with stem cells and all of that, that might relate to some of this. Um, but again, we're still really trying to get it. And then one of the other things that's really complex about brain injury is that we have the blood brain barrier. And so anytime we're delivering a therapeutic, it has to get over that. And we don't necessarily know how to deliver it more effectively. And so that's one of the big problems that we have in brain injuries. How can we make sure that not only is the medication or the therapy getting across the impact of that, getting across the blood brain barrier, but is it getting to the specific area of the brain that needs it the most? And so, you know, preclinical models help a lot in this, um, especially larger animals. And so, you know, by bridging some of the work that we do, and mostly what we do is translational clinical work, um, but with the preclinical studies, we're able to get a little bit closer to it. Um, but I think that's gonna be one of those things that we're gonna be kind of chasing for a while on how can we get areas of the brain to regrow. Um, you know, right now we're still at the place where we wanna prevent it as much as possible. So we don't see degradation in areas um, that then would result in the impact of symptoms and deficits. So it's, it's one of those things that I think will keep many of us busy in our research lives for a while, unfortunately. And so this is an example of what we look at when we look at exosomes. And so this is um, a sample of what we call breachers. Uh, these are individuals who are, their career is part of training individuals on how to work with explosives. And so they have high levels of exposure. So most of these individuals have a thousand or more exposures um, over their careers. And so we were asked to come in and help study these individuals as, especially as they were starting to retire, there were a lot of psychological symptoms as well as reported neurological compromise in that they had problems with concentration and memory. 
And so what we looked at is the kind of inflammatory response. And what we see overall um, in A through D is that when we look at the blood overall, there's really not too much of a signal. We actually see something that's counterintuitive. We see a reduction in TNF alpha, which is an inflammatory related cytokine. And from all of our work in brain injury and military, we see that inflammation overall relates to um, exposures to brain injury, as well as the symptoms that individuals report. And so this was counterintuitive. So we used our, our protocol to look at brain specific exosomes. And then we see the signal cool, um, actually being um, substantial. And so we see increases in IL-6 as well as TNF-alpha, which are both inflammatory related cytokines. And then also what's really important is we see a reduction in that of IL-10, which is an anti-inflammatory um, protein. And so in a normal state of immune health, you would see um, that IL-6 and IL-10 were regulated, such as the ratio would remain the same because IL-10 increases in a way to compensate for overall greater inflammation. And so what we're seeing here is kind of an evidence of immune dysregulation. So what we did from these findings is we've had a study um, with James Stone at UVA to use a PET ligand that allows us to actually look at brain inflammation and to see if these peripheral changes um, relate to central. And I will say that we were excited to see that they are, but we don't have the findings quite ready to release yet. Um, but it does definitely look like the peripheral signal that we're seeing in these exosomes is similar to what we're seeing um, in those individuals when we use a PET ligand. And so I can say also, as I'm kind of waiting for a little bit of a delay, is that PET ligands really kind of open the avenue for us to understand specific mechanisms within brain injury. And so we have a study right now, which is at Walter Reed um, Army Institute. And so we're looking at tau as well as amyloid aggregation in individuals who've had multiple brain injuries. And what's really cool about that is we can look at them over time because we've had them in a study for more than 10 years. So we can look at blood and we can look at neuropsychological functioning as well as MRI. And we can see what would be predictive 10 years later of these aggregations, because um, you know, many of these kind of pathological findings take time. And if they take time, we don't wanna wait in an observational study to find that. We wanna understand why some individuals are more vulnerable. So again, we can intervene early. Um, that might be a change in the activity um, if they've already sustained TBIs, or that might be an intervention that, again, would mitigate the risk for that. And so all of our studies mostly are observational, but we also have a very active interest in how can we actually use these findings as early as possible to really mitigate those risks. And so lastly, I want to show you is just um, overall levels of IL-6. Um, related to the symptoms that they were having also. So um, RPQ is just an overall, um, it's a River Me post-concussive post questionnaire. And overall, it's just um, an approximation of the severity of those. And so not only do we see that the exposure um, really relates to the signal, but we also see that the severity of symptoms does in addition. Um, also, I'd like to talk about one of our consortiums, and this is the Center for Neuro, um, Neurotrauma consortium. And what this is, it's at 18 different uh, veterans administrations across the country. And right now we have about 1900 veterans who are in the study. And those individuals come in and you can see the study group here. Um, so we get those individuals who've had no types of combat. We get individuals with no TBIs and they were able to compare them over time who have those TBIs. We also have a high number of individuals who have multiple TBIs. And so we've been able to look at those individuals and find some signal within that. Um, specifically, what you see in one of these circles here um, in D is that overall exome, exo, exosomal um, IL-6 is related to the number of TBIs. So the greater the number of TBIs, the higher the signal is, as well as greater plasma NFL and exosomal NFL relating overall to the time since injury. And so this really indicates that, again, there's a cumulative nature of these biomarkers aggregating over time that relates to the exposure amount as well as the symptoms. And that we can use these exosomes, again, to get closer to the brain, even in a more chronic um, group of individuals. And many of these individuals have had injuries, you know, 10, 20 years ago. And so the exciting part about this is that we get to follow them over time. One of the really important things about TBI is that 
as individuals age, we think that there's this more compromise period um, and everybody's different. It's not just based on years, but it's based on a lot of different factors. But really that as they age, there's a vulnerability that kind of gets collapsed and that those individuals um, who've had multiple TBIs and have some biomarker changes or early neuroimaging changes are more likely to have early my, um, neurocognitive functioning delays. And so we're looking at these individuals and by having, so right now we have 1900, um, we're looking to get 3000 and then to follow them at five year increments. And so now we're in the second phase of this um, to really understand again, how these early indicators impact risk, because we can use these to then inform the care that we provide and also identify individuals early who are more at risk. And so I've talked a little bit about uh, I'm going to take one question. It looks like one's coming in. Um, should NSAIDs not be recommended after a head injury in the natural inflammatory process be better to heal and have better outcomes? Um, so anti-inflammatory agents, they can be used, especially if an individual has a headache. And we always recommend that. Um, not because we think it's going to not, you know, have a major impact on brain itself, um, but if an individual has a headache, we want to treat it early. So that way they don't have that, again, kind of chronic trajectory of having that. The long-term impact of using those has really not been understood. There's been some studies, but they've been very mixed. And so again, it kind of comes down to that, how much activity is in what areas of the brain. So if you're using an NSAID for treatment of headache, we know that it's going to get there. It's going to have a signal. It's going to have an impact, but is it in the area of the brain that you need? And so we do want to see that inflammatory activity early, but we also want it to be regulated. Um, you know, I didn't talk too much about this, but if the immune activity remains activated too far, um, especially into the subacute period, then that individual is more likely to have headaches and long-term symptoms. So it's really only that acute activity that we want to have going. And that's usually before somebody has a headache. Um, and so it's not necessarily related to that. Um, so I wouldn't say that that would have to really change the clinical care of someone. And really, we just don't quite understand it yet. But the nice thing about um, right now is we have a number of large scale population studies where we're actually being able to tease this out and understand it better. So we will, but I would say, you know, if somebody has a headache, definitely. Um, do we know the impact on the inflammatory process? No, we don't. <laughs> so it kind of remains out there to be understood better. Um, so I'd just like to talk a little bit about lymphatic function. So lymphatic function is really important for the clearance of proteins from the brain. And so um, it was only discovered just in the last real decade to really understand it. And the reason why is usually when brains would come in for pathological studies, um, you know, the meninges are on the outside of the brain, they would just take them off and throw them away, thinking that they really didn't have a function and it wasn't important. But what's found is they are the intermediary between the brain and the CSF and the whole clearance mechanism. And what we know is the lymphatic system is only really active in stage three and stage four sleep. What's important about this with TBI is that TBI influences sleep, especially early following a TBI. And one of the most predictive factors of having a non-optimal recovery is having disruptions in sleep. And so it pulls together all these ideas that we're not having sufficient clearance of things like amyloid and tau and GFAP and NFL. And so that the brain is having them aggregate. And when they aggregate, they're gonna actually result in neuronal damage. And then that neuronal damage can mean that that neuron is silenced and that the function is compromised or it could be um, demised. And so what we want is sufficient clearance, but we also want the blood-brain barrier to allow for inflammatory um, activities to, to commence and be active. And so it's a complex system that we're studying. Um, and so our consortium, what we're looking at is using MRI methods to approximate it in humans, because right now it's a very difficult thing to measure. Um, and really the only way that we know how to um, change it is impairing sleep. And so that's much more easy to do in an animal like a rat or a mouse <laughs> um, who's allowing you to do that. And so we're combining kind of our expertise in MRI, uh, preclinical models, and then my expertise in biomarkers to identify biomarkers that relate to lymphatic clearance, because then we can use that um, as kind of a way to understand like we do in urine, where we look at urine, and then we also have a creatinine 
to correct for the number of proteins or the number of activities going on in that fluid. And right now, because clearance is so impacted by a brain injury, when we look at the blood, we don't know if it's that we're not seeing the proteins yet, is that the impact of clearance? Um, are some individuals different in clearance? And so this is kind of the big thing that gives us a little bit of grayness to what we're doing because we don't know at what time points we're supposed to see it and when it's most important to see in the whole clearance process. And so what we've done through this consortium is to pair these different models so we can obtain biomarkers both in mice and rats as well as in humans. And so Jeff Eilif, who's at the top, um, has been doing some studies in preclinical models, but much more recently in human imaging models to allow for the approximation of lymphatic function. Um, what it used to have to do is that the individual would have to be asleep in an MRI. And I don't know about any of you, but <laughs> I cannot sleep flat in an MRI machine where you're getting the bang, bang, bang of it. And so that really made it difficult to study. And so there's some new advanced methods to do that um, in an individual who's awake. And so we're pairing that and we're using a technology that's a non-hypothesis-based way to identify proteins. Um, and then we're also trying to replicate that in animal models because animal models are much more easy to adapt. Um, so you can see it baseline and then changes over time. And so what we're doing with this consortium is really trying to understand the interaction of all of these factors and how can we translate it into a way to understand this? Because if the individual is not able to clear the proteins, they're gonna aggregate and it's gonna be problematic. But then the other thing is that they're not gonna get the micronutrients that are needed also to deliver for the immune system to be sufficient to have that acute response that allows the initiation of neuronal recovery. And so, um, you know, understanding all of these processes is really difficult, especially when you're thinking about you know, a human living brain that doesn't allow you to access it <laughs> because um, not many people want to give up their brain. There's no way to actively donate any type of brain tissue. We can't get to it. And so how can we try to, as much as we can, you know, get a visualization using imaging methods and then use preclinical models as a way to um, modify or change and see the impact of that on those proteins. Um, and so one of the things that we do uh, in these clinical studies is, again, we get this contrast that allows us to visualize meningeal injuries. And so we've seen a couple of things that map onto these meningeal injuries, including greater inflammation um, as reflected in gene activity, as well as greater activity of GFAP and vascular endothelial growth factor, which is an indicator of vascular changes following a TBI. And so what we see overall, and you can see the scans at the top, is you can see this aggregation of this gadolinium contrast, which is indicative of having this meningeal injury. So again, about half of individuals with the mild TBI will have this. When we look at seven days out, only about 20% of individuals have it then. And so it's part of the recovery process. And we followed a number of individuals at the NIH over a year. And what we see is having this type of scan positive in which they have meningeal injury, is much more predictive to having chronic symptoms over time. And so what we wanna understand is how this meningeal kind of interface is really interacting with the brain. And so what we've been able to do is look at 7T imaging, which allows us to look at anatomical structures in a much more detailed manner. Um, and so we have some findings coming out related to that in that it's not overall neuronal volume that's really compromised, but a couple different systems that are more vulnerable to this lack of nutrients and lack of recovery processes um, that can be impacted overall by this. Um, but again, this gives us an indication that some of the blood-based biomarkers can map onto this and really allow us again to translate a very complex neuroimaging finding into something that we might be able to use a blood-based biomarker for um, in different care settings. And so now I'm going to switch just a little bit for just a couple slides on something kind of exciting that we're going into in our lab. Um, and that's the thought of using sweat as a biomarker. And the great idea about sweat is that it's a biological fluid that is basically left out. Um, it doesn't require biohazard standards because it's thought of as just something that people, you know, sweat and then sit down on a chair and it's there. Um, and, but it actually has some really important um, indications of neurological compromise. 
And so we were really surprised when we started studying sweat. And the way that we do it is through the use of a patch um, that's adhesive, that's four by four. Um, an individual can wear that for a period of time. And then go to the next slide. And so what we've done is we've uh, developed a, a protocol where individuals can wear this um, then we can measure the proteins listed here, which is actually really exciting because even PTAL we can do. Um, and so they wear that for six hours up to 48 hours. They can take that patch off and then they can just mail it back to the lab in the normal mail. And so we find that this patch aggregates the proteins so that way they're not degraded. And then we can look at them once we get the patch back to the lab. And so this allows us to do remote collection of biomarkers and this really opened up a lot of different directions because when we're doing biomarker studies, um, we're getting samples of blood, we have to centrifuge within 60 minutes, then we have to put it into a negative 80. And that is not doable for a lot of different remote settings as well as rural settings. And so the idea is this could be a monitoring method for individuals who can look at things like inflammation or neurofilament light chain, which is an overall indicator of neuronal health. And use this also for interventions to see how these interventions are moderating or mitigating um, some of these biomarkers that we know are related to overall neurological health. And so this is kind of a new direction that we're taking and we're um, using a number of different samples, both in active duty military, um, as well as veterans and also athletes to really look at those. And the other great thing about SWAT is it's proteins go up and down um, based on a lot of different factors. There's circadian variation, and so it's, it's very hard when you get one level of protein to really know what the biological activity of that is. But when you get sweat, you get it over a period of time. Um, and also it's something that was biologically degraded, meaning that it was active. And so we think that that means that there's a signal there that could really be followed up on and be important. And so it opens the doors to a lot of that. And um, other data that I don't have here is that we do see that it generally correlates to blood. Um, at about a 0.4, which is kind of what you expect because blood is a one-time level. And we see that there is some indication that there's a relationship, but we actually think that sweat might be a better performer over time because when we discharge somebody from an emergency room or after a sports-related concussion, they can wear that patch and then they can actually send it back to us and we can see what's in there. And so it allows us to collect additional time points and also kind of the cumulativeness of that. Um, but lastly, it also allows us to collect biomarkers, biomarkers over nighttime hours, um, which is really difficult, of course, to do in somebody's home. You can't have an IV and be pulling blood to do that. And so having this sweat biomarker method allows us to look and see when they were sleeping, what biomarkers were secreted. And so it really kind of allows us to take it to a different direction. So the direction we're taking with the sweat also is the idea that we can develop these into sweat sensors. Um, for overall diagnostics, as well as monitoring in remote settings. Um, the other thing is that kind of putting everything together is, you know, from our findings, we're really seeing that biomarkers and blood um, relate to injury subtypes. Um, once we know the type of injury that an individual has, we can inform therapeutics. Um, you know, not all types of cancers are treated by one drug. <laughs> so it's the same thing with brain injury. We can't just treat it by one medication and say it works. We really need to understand the pathological changes and how they're different and how we can really personalize the therapies we provide. Um, also exosomes allow us to look at central biomarkers. We've progressed to now look at microglia specific exosomes that again, allow us really to look at the inflammatory process, especially early in those individuals. Um, what's exciting is we have ongoing longitudinal studies and many of the individuals that you saw within the aggregate data today and so we're gonna be able to follow them over time to understand how these biomarkers shape symptoms and deficits, especially during that really vulnerable period of aging. Um, you know, as I've come back to Hopkins and thought about things in a more comprehensive way, we're also building models that look at things like gender, race, area of residence, social determinants of health, and how those impact the recovery process, because it's not just the injury itself, but we know that's a lot of complicated things that go into this. And so how can we understand these and build models that allow us to identify those individuals that are most vulnerable? Um, and so that's kind of the exciting area that we're going in our research. And I'm excited that everybody joined today and had really great questions. And um, I encourage anybody to reach out to me if their question wasn't addressed or if there's any way that we could collaborate or work together, or if anybody is looking for training opportunities, our lab is more than welcome. 
all of our instruments were just set up this week. So we're ready to take people on and um, just reach out to us if we can help in any way.